had very specific words for poor. Now listen, they're, and they're all connected. The first meant, it meant not having much. But because you didn't have much, it meant that you didn't have much power or influence. And because you didn't have much power or influence, you would be overlooked by other people. Those three definitions of poor all went together. But when put together, they meant this. It also meant that a person, because they don't have great resources, puts their whole trust in God. So to be poor doesn't mean to not have money. It means to realize that we are completely dependent upon God. And so when you put it together with the Greek language and the way that it's written, it would translate like this. Happy is the man or woman who has realized his own utter helplessness and who has put his whole trust in God. Now that's a whole lot different than being poor in spirit, isn't it? And so here we go from one language to the next. What it's really trying to say is it's a good thing that we've realized we should put our trust in God. And the heaven's perspective is that being poor is a good thing. Now that's very non-American. It's even in some ways anti-Christian church in North America. Because you can find plenty of churches that will tell you you need to be wealthy or you will be wealthy. But the reality is the Bible says being poor is a good thing. The second one that's listed for us is, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Anybody like to be sad? Anybody like to be depressed? No? Well, this is saying it's a good thing. And in this case, the Greek word that's used here is the, actually, it's, there's several words, but it's the, um, it's the form of the strongest word that is used in terms of mourning for someone that you love who has passed away. And it's also used to mean that you are to crawl inside the skin of one who is sad. That's different than empathy, and that's different than sympathy. This is talking about that you're so heartbroken that you'd be willing to crawl inside their skin and to feel that same pain. Blessed is the person who mourns. Okay? It could also mean this. Happy are those who are desperately sorry for the sorrow and suffering of the world. It could mean that. The, the world is a better place when people are sorrowful. Listen, how do they go together? The first one said that we, uh, blessed is what? What was the first one? Poor in, spirit. Poor in spirit. So we learn that it's okay to be separated from things. To, to be destitute is a good thing, to realize our dependence upon God. But the second beatitude says it's not okay to be separated from people. So what's the mission of Friends Community Church? Connecting people to people and people to God. That's the mission and that's what's captured in these first two. You see, the world would be a much poorer place if it wasn't for people who were sorrowful. Think of Mother Teresa for a minute. I don't know if you've read the story about Mother Teresa that came out. It was out about a year and a half ago. Uh, they found some of her memoirs and she had written that she felt like she was not worthy to go to heaven. And that at times she doubted her own faith. I, I mean, you've got to be joking. This lady left uh, one of the most affluent convents in the world to go work with the poorest of the poor. And that one lady, by her life, brought to light their condition. Uh, one nun. One. That we all became aware of these people dying of, of leprosy and, and AIDS. It's an amazing story. And the world's a better place because of people like Mother Teresa. Now, do you remember when Mother Teresa died? Do you remember who else died right at the same time? Princess died. They died within a day or two of each other. And 48 bajillion people watched Di's funeral. You know, like seven of us watched the other one. But in terms of eternity, whose work is going to last longer? Mother Teresa's. Why? Because she was willing to mourn for those who were mourning. Being a Christ follower is about caring. You can't separate being a follower of Christ without caring for other people. We should care about injustices that are being done. We should care about people that don't have food. We should care about people that can't pay their power bill. We should care about people that don't know Christ. You can't be a Christ follower and not care. It's just not possible. So notice this, the beatitude then in its fullness would mean that happy is the man or woman who is desperately sorry for their own sin and for their own unworthiness. We talked last week about grace. It's exactly what grace is, that we should be sorry for our sin. What this means is that we can't repent 
unless we're truly sorry for our sin. My dad used to say to me, I do something wrong, and it was like, you know, the 80 millionth time I've done it. And I'd say, Dad, I'm really sorry. And my dad's answer was, well, no, if you're really sorry, you wouldn't do it again. Well, I understand what he meant, but I now as an adult, I understand there are people who struggle with things that it's not that they don't want to do it, it just it's, keeps happening and it's part of their it's part of their life. Maybe it's a, an addiction or a dependency. Some things happen, you don't really mean for it to happen, it just happens. But what my dad was trying to say, until you're really, 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 really sorry, you'll keep doing this. And, and there's there's a biblical basis for us that eventually we have to hate our sin. That's how we'll stay away from it. You have to develop a new way of thinking to the point you just can't stand your sin. Just like if we're going to go on a diet, next week Miss Karen's going to come here and try to change our minds about the way we think about food. If you change your mind, you can change your behavior. Because our thoughts become attitudes and beliefs, and our beliefs become actions. You can't change your actions if you don't change the way you think. You buy 30 days of Nutrisystems, you're going to be back on the cheeseburgers on day 32 if you don't change the way you think. You have to change the way you think about food, change what you believe about food to change your actions. And from a church perspective, think about this. We need a new ministry for X, Y, Z. No, we don't. We don't need a new behavior. We need a new way of thinking first. We have to think like heaven. We have to think like the kingdom that will change the way we believe and then our ministries become reality. I want to just go out and start a ministry just because, you know, six people walk in and, you know, they're all bald-headed and need, you know, broken. That doesn't start a ministry. That just because. You've got to think about this. What does heaven say? What does heaven say? How do we think? You've got to match those two, and that will change our behavior. It's, it's an important thought. See, people will change when they come up against something that opens their eyes. The, old, the counselor saying is, people will stay the same until... The pain of change is less than the pain to stay the same. People won't change until they're up against something and they just absolutely have to change. And this is what the cross does for you and me. It makes us actually visualize our sin. The, the cross is where you and I look at this thing and what we have to realize is we almost have to say this to ourselves. That is what sin can do. Sin can take the most pure, amazing life and destroy it. And it was because of my sin that he was on that cross. Once we've experienced our own heart-opening event, whatever that is, then we can be comforted. Because then we can have what we call penitence. Penitence is a combination of grief and mourning, but also repentance. It's a three-step process. And if you're struggling today with, with grace, I want you to listen to this line. As strange as it sounds, the way to the joy of forgiveness is through the desperate sorrow of a broken heart. The way to joy is to have your heart broken first. It's like a funnel. Okay, Jesus said you've got to enter through the narrow gate, right? It's like a funnel. A lot of people think that coming to Christ is living your life like this, but it's not. It's once you get through the funnel, then it opens up. You've got to get through the little skinny part. But once you get through there, then it opens up. And what happens there is you've got to have your heart broken to realize you need God, that you are desperate for God. And once you get through there, then it opens up. But what a lot of folks see is, oh, no, no, narrow life, narrow life. No, 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 it's a narrow way. But then it's an abundant life. Ultimately, what this beatitude could mean to us is happy is the man or woman whose heart is broken for the world's suffering and for their own sin, because out of that sorrow they will find the joy of God. Now that's a whole lot different than blessed are those who mourn. It's talking about us realizing our own need and the world's need for God in all kinds of ways. The third and last one for today is blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. In the United States, meek equals geek. <laughs> it does. It means spineless, 